for the name, for the loans, for the exhibition, for the expertise. It's very important to understand. I'm, I'm a Frenchman, but I'm working for the Department of Culture and Tourism of Abu Dhabi. Louvre Abu Dhabi is really part of the um, uh, Ministry of Culture of Abu Dhabi, Ministry of Culture and Tourism of Abu Dhabi, but has a very special relationship with the French museum system. So the Louvre, but with the Louvre, all the French museum. It's a very long journey. And I, when I see so many uh, ambitious projects in India of uh, renovation, of new museum, of new uh, cultural spaces, I have to uh, uh, share with you as a, as a comfort that uh, it took us 10 years from the inception in uh, 2007 up to the opening in 2017. So these projects require time. We are within the framework of an extremely ambitious uh, program for Saadiyat, which is the Saadiyat Cultural District. You know, Abu Dhabi is an archipelago, not far from here, a few hours of, uh, by plane. And the Louvre Abu Dhabi was opened in 2017. We opened uh, last year a beautiful Abrahamic family house by David Adjé, where you have a synagogue, a church, and a mosque, which are sharing the same architecture on the same place of uh, respect and exchange. And we are waiting very soon for the Zayed National Museum that will tell the story of the UAE, for the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, um, which is going to uh, explore the global south and the modernity of our world. We have a natural history museum just on, uh, on the side, very close to the Louvre Abu Dhabi. And you see it uh, from close, uh, Team Lab Phenomena, which is also coming. All of these museums are connected and share uh, a very strong bid in uh, and, and commitment in, in culture, education, knowledge, but also uh, research. Um, this is a, so you had a master plan, but this is a reality. What you see from our windows, from this is taken from the Louvre Abu Dhabi, uh, uh, almost from my office. You can see the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, which is uh, moving uh, with Frank Gehry, moving uh, very quickly. Even quicker, the Zayed National Museum, which is. Uh, uh, you can recognize these uh, this wings, uh, and it's going to be beautiful, and it's, it's coming now. Um, so this is the context in which we work. So now I will go pillar by pillar to, to see how this connected, uh, connectedness is reflected in everything we do and how it is uh, infused. First thing would be the architecture, because uh, as you saw uh, uh, through the little uh, movie, we are, uh, uh, I would say, a beautiful uh, space at first. And we are, um, uh, thanks to Jean Nouvel, uh, we, we are within a contextualized architecture, which means that Jean Nouvel, of course, is a Pritzker Prize, is an international, is a French, but uh, he has an international reach uh, in terms of building and, and uh, achievement. But each, for each project, Jean is um, deep diving into the culture of the place and, and, and the roots. So you can see his first sketch when he, he invented this museum. So he wanted to go back to the Arabic uh, inspiration, to the Musharabiyeh, to something which is also uh, very close to, uh, to what you have in India, but this, the way of seeing through, of uh, using the uh, uh, transparency, he used the light in the souk, the Arabic Medina, and, and this, uh, this effect. All this has been boiled down into creating a museum, which is actually a little uh, museum city, a, a Medina, the Arab world for, for a city. You can see that. And we have integrated within the city, within the street of the city, some existing artworks. You can recognize uh, Rodin sculpture or uh, uh, commissioned artworks uh, like these great walls um, made by the American artist Jenny Holzer. Uh, we also have this very special uh, and very sensitive element, which is a rain of light. So the, the, the physical effect of the light through the dome, which is uh, creating a uh, um, sensorial uh, perception of time, very meditative. Um, voilà. And we are uh, open to the sea. I, I mentioned the sustainability and the importance of, uh, of understanding the environment. We are uh, really on the sea for all sides. So Saïdiat is a real island. It's not an artificial island. It's an existing island. And we are uh, um, connected to it. And of course, of course, the museum is beautiful uh, from day, uh, the, the, the rain of light, but also from night, from all angles. So that's the way the museum uh, uh, connectivity can be used to, to root the, the architecture in a place. But I would say that maybe the, the most uh, striking and, and the most um, important uh, in reinvention of Louvre Abu Dhabi is definitely its collection, its content. We have, through the intergovernmental inter agreement, a special relationship with all the French system. So we were able to tell, 
to reinvent in Abu Dhabi, in this place which doesn't have the historical relationship that the, 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 the museum in Paris had, but which had this capacity to connect with the world, we were able to reinvent um, a story of humanity. And so we do it that with something which could have been a constraint at the beginning, shared collection, loans, traveling elements, and we turn this constraint into a, a strength of the narrative. So we have shared collection, which are uh, by nature coming from the French Museum, but very quickly we added uh, partners in the Arab world and partners all over the UAE, and we're reaching out to, uh, to new partners. Uh, we have done that with the Philippines, with, um, with uh, Seoul, and, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, very quickly with India, if we can, by, uh, by inviting the world to come through the gallery. So uh, this is a very specific shared collection model with a semi-permanent museography, which means that the museography is thought as evolution, in, in constant evolution. The showcases, the display, everything is made for evolution. And we have this uh, global network we're very proud of. You can see, so the sources of artworks would come from the French loans. This is a 10-year process, 2017 to 2027. So 10 years of French loan that help us to, to get started. There is a collection that we have acquired, and I have my colleagues, uh, Ferreira and Guilhem, who are part of the scientific uh, team of uh, the Louvre Abu Dhabi, acquiring artworks and building this collection. But also what we call the ambassador objects, so the uh, uh, many loans coming from the UAE, Oman, uh, Saudi, Jordan, Philippines, South Korea. And this is an uh, always evolution uh, um, uh, relationship uh, to come. You would see that. The numbers, uh, and I see uh, Guilhem and Ferrand, we're not completely uh, in agreement. They change all the time. This is a number. It's actually closer to uh, 6,000 or 7,000 uh, items if we count the series, which are not captured. So the collection uh, size is growing by the day uh, in, in terms of volume. The loan from the French Museum are also in rotation, but we are around uh, 250, 200 now that they are uh, moving. And we have 40 of these very important ambassador loans. Um, the, the, the story is organized on, um, on a chronological thematic approach. So the main collection, you would say, uh, you would see them. We start, uh, so sorry, just one, one thing on the, before I'm going uh, uh, deep. The classical universal museum was born at the same time than the encyclopedic approach. And you can see that in the Louvre, in the British Museum, in the Met, the idea of classifying um, uh, the, the, the typologies of, of civilization, uh, uh, like, like, like uh, entry in a dictionary or, or like in an encyclopedia, which is a, a, a fantastic way of organizing uh, knowledge on artworks. There, is, uh, the, there are these uh, typologies, there are this accumulation of objects, and of course the temptation of exhaustivity to be, to be exact, you want to have uh, as many uh, precise objects as possible. When we are reinventing in Abu Dhabi uh, the Universal Museum, we uh, decided to base it on the storytelling, on the chronology and thematics, on the connectivity, the representativity, on the, uh, on the uh, analogies, on the um, uh, uh, patterns which are in common, on the, on the great moment of, uh, of history. So we're still in the same, uh, we're rooted in the tradition of the Universal Museum, but we shifted the model towards something which is more in the connection and in the fluidity of the, um, of, the, of the story. It doesn't mean that we are not connected to the science which comes with the encyclopedia, but it's just the way we are presenting it to the visitor, which is uh, uh, insisting on these uh, analogies and on connection. So well, uh, I will try it in a, in a few minutes just to, uh, to uh, tempt you to come. This is the first room, which is a, a manifesto of communities where we have uh, trilogies of objects sharing uh, something in common, and you have three golden masks sharing the, the desire to, 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 uh, to uh, protect the disease or, or to accompany them uh, behind the death. The Filipino mask in the center, um, uh, a pre-Columbian mask uh, in, in, uh, in Peru, and, and something from the Levant on, on the right. So this is, these objects are beautiful in themselves, and they share something anthropologically very strong that you can understand at first sight as a starting point. We are now moving to the, to the uh, time machine. Uh, we, we, in the galleries, you see these huge showcases that allows us to have this uh, evolution. You see the first uh, um, object from uh, the, the loan from Jordan, the Al-Razain, the two beautiful two-headed uh, statues, one of the biggest uh, 
um, 6,000 years ago, uh, one of the most important uh, human representation in, a, in the history of the world. And then we, we're going on. You can see always the UAE are in the story, and, and we, we managed to, uh, to, 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 to move through time and through space by a, a chronological and thematic approach. We see a Bronze Age uh, showcase on the right. I'm moving, uh, we're moving, we were at the first uh, settlement, the first kingdom, and now we're moving to the first empires. And you can see uh, also these very important galleries in which we show um, the uh, religious phenomenon, and we are displaying in the art of the Arab world uh, artworks from all religion um, presented uh, in a very, very respectful way. Um, not in a ritual way, but um, underlying uh, their meaning of their importance for, for the world. And you can see what we have in uh, common in our uh, uh, aspiration. Uh, and, and this is a very, very important uh, uh, gallery that uh, has been uh, flagged by the, by the leadership of the country as, as uh, representing also the vision of the, of the UAE. Um, uh, this, uh, so this was the object, more on, on, on 3D objects, and, and this is uh, the pendant of this uh, gallery where we are displaying the same, in, with the same respect approach uh, the sacred text of, uh, of uh, all religion. In this, uh, uh, it's, it's darkened also for the respect, but, but because of the, of the sensitivity of, uh, of paper or artwork. Um, I will go on, we move through times, so, uh, um, a beautiful uh, uh, connection uh, uh, through the Silk Route to uh, uh, connecting the world, uh, we're accelerating. So we have also a formal comparison point. It's a strange, my team made a strange. These two statues are actually side by side. Something we, we, uh, we felt uh, um, when we visit uh, uh, some of your museums is, is the contact, of course, with the Indian civilization and, and, the, and the Roman and Greco Roman. This is a Gandhara uh, and, um, and the Roman Togatu. So we have the formal connection, the obvious analogy that we can, uh, that we can explain visually. You can either uh, intuit it or understand it, depending on the level of, of uh, research that you want to put during your visit. We're moving to modernity. I'm, I'm jumping a few centuries. Uh, uh, always uh, having an object, of course, we have a, we have a small but uh, a beautiful uh, uh, Indian collection, a few elements. We also show, the, and we finish the parkour by this tension between the modernity and uh, rock art. Uh, so this is, the, this is, in a very short time, the, the, what we're trying to say with our museum. I will now move to um, the exhibition program, which is also, so this, this gallery is where the backbone of the museum, but we also have a very uh, uh, rich uh, uh, exhibition program with a children museum that I mentioned uh, um, uh, two days ago, with a competition of artists living in the GCC, in the, in the, in the Gulf, and uh, between uh, two and four, uh, more and more, uh, two only to have a big, uh, uh, big temporality um, in, in, the, in the season of, of international exhibition coming uh, from the French uh, museum system. So you can see some of the beautiful ones. Uh, Dragon and Phoenix was really an exchange between the Islamic world and, and China. The Furusia was uh, also a connection between the, uh, the Western uh, chivalry and the Forsan, which is the uh, Arabic uh, equivalent. Um, uh, we also have this uh, great moment of art history, this turning point. Uh, uh, in the art history, uh, the, the, the golden age of uh, Dutch painting, Impressionism, and this is where the access to the French Museum uh, plays, uh, of course, the most. Each one is made by one different uh, uh, French uh, museum, but we also are, are tackling um, universal uh, invention, uh, photography as a universal language, and how we change the world. So this was a global exhibition with photography from all over the world. Stories of Paper was the study of uh, 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 paper as a universal medium and how it would uh, impact forever the uh, history of art. Uh, that the Children's Museum with emotion, gamification at the core, but uh, the children win only if they look at the artworks. This is just to tempt you. So we have uh, right now, until the 4th of June, Bollywood Superstars that is going to Musée du Quai Branly. Um, we will have in September uh, the three monotheism presented with letters of light. Uh, and uh, Cartier Show, uh, uh, Art Year, with, uh, again, every year we have this competition. And Cartier and the Islamic uh, inspiration of modern time is going to be a beautiful, beautiful show. Um, uh, also, uh, also inviting some, uh, some beautiful pieces from, uh, from India. Um, uh, voilà. so, so that was the second pillar. The third pillar is the, the visitors, and we have a people-centered strategy for the visitors. 
we, are, uh, we have artworks from all over the world and we have visitors from all over the world. So um, it's, uh, this diversity is very important to us. We have a fair balance between international visitors and, and, uh, and uh, local or resident, uh, resident visitors, meaning when I mean resident, I mean, uh, of course, the uh, Emirati, because it is uh, the key population in, in, in the country, but also everybody who is calling uh, Abu Dhabi there or, or the UAE their home. Um, the, the, the mix is, uh, and, and the Emirati are among the highest uh, 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 repeated visitors. The uh, mix is very important because we are on a pattern 70-30 of uh, relationship between the uh, tourists and the people living in, in the UAE. Uh, we also are, uh, um, uh, in our values, uh, connected, open-minded, mindful and innovative, which means that we want to be accessible, we want to be inclusive, we want to make sure that uh, children, people of determination can, uh, can join us. So you have here the, the, the mix between the tourism uh, efficiency, 70%, and the communities. And this is a beautiful program with the elder uh, Emirati telling stories inside the galleries in front of the object from, from, uh, from the territory. Uh, we know we have a barometer that we started since the day one, um, and we know also where people are coming from. Uh, uh, in India are actually one of the biggest segments, huh? 10, 12 percent all the time. And we're using app. We need to speak all languages, so uh, the app is a good way to, uh, to reach out. We're using the technology to do that. It can, music is also universal. We uh, pride ourselves in offering new uh, experience like the uh, beautiful uh, kayak visit or uh, yoga under the dome. That was a beautiful, for yoga day, beautiful uh, yoga moment under the dome of uh, Louvre Abu Dhabi uh, last uh, 21st of June. And we will do it again uh, this, uh, for the next uh, yoga day with even more people. The, after the food for thoughts, uh, food for uh, food uh, uh, culinary is also very important. We have um, Aptitude Cafe on Phuket, part of the offer on a great sh uh, shop. Uh, I mentioned several times the swatch that we did with uh, our collection, um, and, uh, and we have this kind of uh, experience. So we are thinking all the experience around. And I will finish um, a little bit uh, too, 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 too slow, but the fourth pillar, which may be the most important, which is the staff. The Louvre Abu Dhabi is a place of, um, of uh, uh, transformation and of uh, uh, creation of a new generation of Emirati professionals, of museums, and bringing the international expertise and building up the one that we have in Abu Dhabi. Building up, starting by the people we have, and giving access. Again, it's about connectivity, connection to the network, connection to the artworks, connection to the universities. You can see a few elements here. Um, and I will uh, uh, just say some of our, uh, some of our uh, great uh, uh, team are, are uh, uh, participating to, to that. And having uh, this exposure, we take people who are good, people who are already learning the jobs. We are. This is. academic and professional training and a testament to that and I hope that we are uh, leaving a, a trace on the, on the society and Louvre Abu Dhabi uh, of course will provide some of the people that will work in the other museum but can also have a regional impact. Thank you so much. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Manu, for that wonderful presentation. I still have, have my notes from your opening session, the eight points, and uh, I got people first today and educate the gays from last time. Uh, but it's exciting to see that the Louvre Abu Dhabi has been the impetus of the catalyst for so many new museums to be opening in Abu Dhabi with such wonderful architects backing those projects. Um, and um, before we invite the next uh, guest, I think uh, our We'll have to have some housekeeping rules to tell you. Thank you. Thank you so much, SSG. Uh, I will just request and invite Mukda Sinaji, Joint Secretary, Ministry of Culture, Government of India, uh, to come on stage and present a memento to Mr. Manuel Rabate. Uh, from the very beginning, from the inaugural day, he is with us and he has been uh, taking a very active part 
uh, in this expo and guiding us and enlightening us. So we are very thankful to you, Mr. Labad Rabate, and uh, we wish to present a memento to Mr. Manuel Rabate, Director, Lahore Museum, Abu Dhabi. So we have very young friends uh, just joined us. I welcome all the young friends from the colleges and the schools here who are present. And I will request Mukdaji to present a memento. Please put your hands together to uh, express our gratitude to Mr. Manuel Rabate, the director, Lowry Museum, Abu Dhabi. Thank you very much for being a part of this International Museum Expo, Mr. Manuel Rabate. And uh, one information uh, for the museum directors from Ministry of Culture, they are requested to proceed to VIP lounge, all the museum directors from the Ministry of Culture. Uh, they are just requested to proceed to VIP lounge for, uh, for an urgent meeting. So I will request the directors to be there. And uh, I will request Asaji to go forward, proceed, uh, invite the next speaker in this session. Thank you. And now to the next presentation, Dr. Sachin Anand Joshi is a member secretary in the Apex scale at the Indira Gandhi National Center of the Arts, IGNCA, India's premier institution in the field of arts and culture under the Ministry of Culture, Government of India, since 2016. Dr. Joshi is a renowned writer, theater artist, academician, who has served as the vice chancellor of the KT University of Journalism in Raipur for 10 years. Earlier, he served as the registrar and dean of the MCRPV Bhopal, a university for the discipline of journalism and mass communication. He has authored many books in a variety of disciplines, such as short stories, poetry, satire, memoirs, and published several articles in reputed journals and magazines. He has edited several prestigious publications, including the speeches of the Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, for Publications Division. He edited, his edited books include Connecting Through Culture, Selected Words of Mahatma on Culture and Civilization, and The Eternal Truth and Teachings of Guru Nanak Dev Ji. He has been conferred with several prestigious awards at national levels for his contribution in the field of culture and literature. He's a life member of INTAC and also many prestigious uh, committees, including the NMML and the UGC. Welcome, Dr. Doshi. Thank you, Mr. Asad. My fellow panelists, most respected Sri Rajiv Sethi ji, Mr. Manuel Rabate, distinguished audience in the auditorium, and dear students. I am delighted to be here in the International Museum Expo, but I am a little frightened to talk about a subject which may not suit for this kind of a gathering, where people are deliberating about the museums. I am going to talk something about demuseumization. And this is the subject which I think uh, needs a little thought. And I am talking to you in particularly in Indian context. So please uh, understand that whatever I am telling you is entirely focusing on the Indian context. And I, I apologize if I would hurt anybody's feeling regarding anything which I am going to talk. They are not intentional. Another thing is that since I belong to the Ministry of Culture, let me give the disclaimer that my thoughts do not belong to the thoughts of Ministry of Culture. They are purely an individual thoughts. So it's only a food for thought which I am trying to put in front of you. So current trends in the museum fields are mostly Eurocentric. Museums feel developed from collectors who were rich and who used to travel to faraway places and who used to bring objects to their countries, mainly European, from colonies, Asia, Africa, Pacific, South America, etc. Even the word museum is derived from the Greek word muses. Museum field evolved all over the world from a vision of Europeans and Americans. 
All these countries are full of objects looted, brought, purchased, borrowed, and gifts from erstwhile colonies. The interpretation of these objects is through Western ethos. Museology taught in India is based on the curriculum developed in the East. There has been a trend which can be termed as museumization of objects. Objects are not displayed or kept in context. Museums have become synonymous to history. Custodians holding the objects are completely oblivious to the background of the object. And that is why I am trying to present a few cases. For instance, Western paintings of Renaissance period in Europe are treated and varnished and are displayed in aesthetically pleasing manner, whereas objects belonging to our cultures have been displayed along with accretions like patina, corrosion, deformation, etc., over them, giving them antique, old, ethnographic look, etc. Completely ethos in the Indian context. Uh, the, the most pious Vrindavani vast, which is being hanged as hanging religious oblique ritual equipment. This is the Vrindavani Vastra. And I, I remember when I went to <coughs> a museum in France to see another piece of Vrindavani Vastra. It was kept in highest of security. And the people in uh, Assam were anxiously, uh, anxiously waiting to receive that Vrindavani Vastra. And a huge expectation was there. And uh, they were expecting lakhs and lakhs of people to receive that. Vrindavani Vastra, which was almost 400, 500 years old. But if it is hanged like this, this is not an object to be hanged like this that we all know. Normally, these objects belong to religious, tribal, folk, and classical forms. However, the objects from India are classified in Western museum terminology as ethnographic objects. Surprisingly, Mughal miniature of Jahangir era is kept in Middle East department. Few years back, the Vrindavani Vastra of Assam was classified under China department. Lately, it has been put in textile collection, but not in Indian collection. There are innumerable examples of such discrepancies. Some are out of ignorance, but some are deliberate. Museum field has been subject to such stubble discrimination since the establishment of first museum in India and is still continuing. There is a requirement of complete redefinition and exploration of artifacts and their housing, which currently is known as museums in India. It is important here to mention briefly the development of museums, archaeology, and cultural institutions in India. In the eyes of the Europeans, India was maligned as a land of monstrous, barbarian, childish, stringent races. Then with the new developments in archaeology, India became for the West, the home of heroic Aryan race and the Indo-European tongues, and the holy spring of Buddhism and the art of the Far East. These impressions, coupled with historical discoveries made by the British district collectors and archaeologists in the late 19th centuries, led them to, the, led them to believe strongly as the benevolent colonizers, as custodians of India's past. They thought that only their archaeologists and historians were believed to have accessed the real past of India, a nation which has degenerated into a hopeless state of cultural amnesia. The patronizing imperial policy of preservation of Indian culture reflected all these contradictory readings of India in its photographed, lithographed documentation of various obligatory derbers of then rulers of small or big states who had submitted to the empire the restoration and museumization of architectural monuments. This also led to educational policies which shielded the Indian artisans from corrupting the influence of modernization. And you can see how this, how we have been practicing to cater the living heritage. This particular image is from the temple of Dharasuram which is famous for its beautiful sculptures. They are known as the beautiful miniature sculptures. And how religiously people are wrapping it with the, with the cloth and daily rituals are being performed on this uh, sculpture. Immediately after the independence, India employed certain experts from developed nations to build its founding models as far as those 
of the best in the world. Some of the cultural institutions were the National Museum Delhi, National Gallery of Modern Art, National Institute of Design, Film Institute, etc. All our places like temples, gurdwaras, tombs, churches, etc. are living heritage that are fostered by local population. The systems in these places have been developed according to local needs and culture. The tangible and intangible heritage are interlinked with each other. The true experience of the material heritage can be felt only in the context of immaterial heritage, that is, rituals. Even storage of artifact can be more effective if cultural significance is attached to the objects. Our places like Taj Mahal, Golden Temple, Meenakshi Temple, etc., are live examples of management of cultural heritage. You can see how a temple can have the uh, uh, artifacts and art objects which can also be a source of education and teaching for a public by and large, which are generally uh, kept as only an ob object in, the, in a normal museum. The example, this is there, the Ramaswamy temple of Kumbhakonam, where Ramayan stories are depicted on the temple walls, can be seen as pedagogic material for children. Art is a living tradition in India. No doubt the skill in art forms are degrading due to neglect of true artists. Their only survival option is either to work for expensive designers as their artisans or by selling their stuff through hearts and emporiums. They are always at the mercy of these middlemen or looking towards the government aid. Still, the words used from art for artists from villages, tribal cultures, folk traditions are artisans. We are still carrying the colonial baggage which is insulting and, lack, insulting and lacks pride of a nation. It is really needed to revamp our museums, art centers, art galleries. It requires holistic change to include art appreciation from Indian eyes and perspective. Most of the museum professionals prefer to grade trained in Western institutes and museums. They try to copy the same methodology for exhibitions. Most of the books in museum field which become part of curriculum are written by foreign authors. Even the terms used for museum elements, architecture, building, showcases, gallery, etc. are in foreign languages. Museums, as they are currently managed, lack the connection with local ethos. Only few museums in India are visited by local population, such as National Museum, Chhatrapati Shivaji Museum, Bhaulad Museum, Indian Museum, Victoria Memorial, Baroda Museum, Akbor Museum, uh, City Palace of Jaipur. These visits are associated with the building, history, and some peculiar objects housed in these museums. However, another thousand museums, and day before yesterday, we uh, launched a directory of museums which says that we have 1,200 museums in India. Such museums are lying in a state of neglect and their objects or messages are not communicated to the local population. This deprives the local population from having the benefits of understanding and learning from the invaluable treasure hidden in the local museums. If the museums are curated with local perspective and context, it is sure that the people, by and large, would be able to sustain the museums without any external assistance from the government or foreign agency. It is high time that the museums are redefined and given new nomenclature, explained, communicated, preserved, secured, according to Indian context for the benefit of public at large, involving Indian artisans, musicians, dancers, and all, and all cultural forms in which India is one of the richest countries in the world. This Eurocentric approach to museums has not only led many important aspects of, cultural de of culture develop and they are missing from the museums. Conservation of artifact is an important aspect of museums. We have seen recent, in recent times, since India has been following the approaches of developed in the West, on, uh, West for the conservation of art, artifacts, many artifacts have been subject to irreparable damages. Use of lacquers on wall paintings of ajanta, cellulose, exilate, lamination of manuscripts, removal of corrosion using electrolytic methods are just a few examples. And if you recollect a few days back, India today brought out a special issue on the state 
of the artifact state of the mural paintings in Ajanta, and a serious concern was expressed in that entire uh, issue of India today. In case of manuscripts, we chose the Western approach and completely neglected the time-tested age-old practices of conservation, which were part of the rituals. In India, the traditional calendar is different from the Gregorian calendar. The traditional calendars are mainly based on lunar motions, and special days, festivals, are earmarked for carrying out rituals, practices to avoid growth of fungus, insects, and other degeneration problems. For example, cleaning of manuscripts on Jeshta Shukla Panchami among Jains is a part of the ritual. It helps aeration, aeration of manuscripts to keep away insects from and periodic cleaning. Wrapping of manuscripts in red cloth is another age-old practice in India and has kept manuscripts safe from insects and dust. Use of neem leaves, camphor, smoke of samrani or loban, Cloves are few examples of preventive conservation being practiced in monasteries, temples, etc. These practices are even used by individuals. And you can see Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts has been teaching about the process of preventive conservation. And we have done quite a extensive research in these fields. Modern museums, archives, and libraries ignored these rituals and adopted modern conservation strategies, which are expensive and not sustainable in long run in the majority of institutions in India. While old, old age practices, if kept intact, would have saved a lot of important heritage material from decay. It is high time that these practices are put to test using modern day scientific analysis and brought back to museums, archives, and libraries for making conservation practices sustainable and durable. IGNC has been documenting the rituals practiced in different religious places in India. One such example of documentation of rituals of Brihadeshwara Temple in Sanjavur. In India and other countries where there has been a continuity of civilization and tradition, it is seen that some of the important tangible heritage has been saved. The main reason for the safeguard of these objects is mainly the rituals and traditions attached to it. You can see the kind of Abhisheka which is being done on a temple. And this Abhisheka is being done with a, with a well-practiced well scientific methods. Such rituals are prevalent from generation to generation. The ethos behind care and restoration of the objects are no way similar to the modern conservation as we see today. However, periodical practices, daily, weekly, or annually, if studied thoroughly, we would find logic behind them and intend to conserve these things naturally. The ritual may be termed as curation, and in temples for cleaning the idols and buildings, such curatorial practices are prevalent even today. Name such as Abhishekam, Alepanam, so many things are there which are being done in the temples. These rituals are there to do the conservation. Even the kolam in the traditional style, uh, which is prevalent in, uh, in uh, South India, they are also to prevent uh, the insects. This is a very beautiful example of insect control in these areas, and this is also eco-friendly. The Indian tradition has been to celebrate art as a part of the daily life. The daily routine of an Indian family involves a lot of artistic activities. Activities like putting rangoli or creating auspicious motives in front of house has been a part of daily routine. It was never in our customs or traditions to preserve these things in a museum because we had the capacity to create such things on a daily basis. Similarly, our temples or murts had large amount of artworks in form of sculptures, frescoes, murals, or brass statues. Such things were created to educate and entertain people. The intent was to put these things in daily routine. These places were not restricted to religious assemblies, but were places of social interaction and artistic displays. When we see exquisite murals created in Brihadeshwar temple, we realize that the entire history has been depicted for the knowledge of the common people.
Unfortunately, today you are not in a position to see those murals which are there in the Pradakshana of Brihadeshwar temple because there has been experiments of conservation which are not done in the traditional Indian manner. So they have to now close the gallery for the benefit of the people. No one can see those galleries. Even the Ajanta cave paintings are not only piece of art created for the benefit of future generations, but are contemporary narrative of these days. Golden Temple entertain lakhs of people every day. Many of those come to learn and understand crux and essence of the religion. Sambhet Shikhar in Giridi allows people to realize the ethos of sacrifice and devotions. We have never been people who would condense their piece of arts into museums and restrict for selected few. Our purpose of art has been very democratic and liberal. We believe in keeping our arts available and open because for us, our religious or social places were also the places for display and discuss art. To conclude, it is important that we come out of the colonial mindset and try to present Indian heritage as per rich and diverse tradition of our country based on the principle of Vasudeva Kutumbakam. Culture is a living concept in India, unlike the Western world, where too much of modernization, imperialism, and hegemonic approach has created a gap between the presentation and the actual context. The lifestyle which includes museum has resulted in warming of the planet and the solution lies in the traditions and sustainable practices still being followed in the cultural hinterlands of India. And that is, I presume, is the right approach to demuseumize our thought and philosophy. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Joshi, for this uh, very interesting uh, and important presentation. You know, art is a living tradition in India. Art is a part of our daily lives. And someone said earlier, India is a living museum. I, I loved your, the, the conservation, the preventive conservation uh, uh, parts of it. It is so true. Our ancestors knew things which we are not following these days. Uh, just, uh, you want to take over? Thank you. Thank you, Asadji. And I will request Asad Lalji. Please uh, present a memento to Dr. Sachidanan Joshi ji. Uh, as we all know, Dr. Sachidanan Joshi ji, member secretary, the executive and academic head of IGNCA, and who is a very renowned, reputed scholar of history and mass communication, a writer, a poet. Please put your hands together to uh, express our gratitude to Dr. Sachidanan Joshi ji for his wonderful presentation and contribution in the field of art culture and media. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sir. And uh, now I will request, I will uh, over to Asidji, please, for further proceeding. Thank you. Um, and um, now to the last of the presentations, uh, and I think you're all excited and waiting for it. Uh, our next speaker needs no introduction, but here goes. Noted uh, internationally for his cross-cultural practice, Padma Bhushan Sri Rajiv Sethi is acknowledged as South Asia's first scenographer. Across five decades, Mr. Sethi's work is in design and architecture, performance and festivals, exhibitions and publications, policies and programs, has identified ways to bring contemporary relevance to the traditional skills of vulnerable artisans, community, and creative stakeholders. His unique thinking and proactive interventions have created a benchmark of legacy enterprise in an area of mass production and globalization. Mr. Sethi's scenographic career, coupled with a considerable theatrical experience, positioned him to move effortlessly from one discipline to another with a consistent vision for transdisciplinary curatorial initiatives. As a founding trustee and chairperson of the Asian Heritage Foundation, he has synergized efforts to preserve and celebrate the subcontinent's rich cultural heritage by championing the cause of creative and cultural industries of, of South Asia. A few words on Mr. Sethi's 
formative years may shed some light on his growth. He spent three years working with Pierre Cardin in Paris and was supported by designers like Ray and Charles Eames. He was closely mentored by eminent Gandhians like Kamla Dev Chattopadhyay and directed by Kupul Jaikar, Ila Bhatt, Jira Sarabhai to serve in rural India's augmenting livelihood. In the next half hour, he will see some more of his memorable artistic, theatrical, and grassroots endeavors setting world standards. Mr. Sethi has been the recipient of many citations and awards globally and in India, lectured in universities and forums across the world, including Princeton, Harvard, IITs, design institutes, and international conferences. Welcome, Mr. Sethi. Technology enables you to keep substitutes. So if you give me a minute, and if you're able to work this, I'll be able to show many pictures. If not, I'll just use my mouth. Many hum suffers gathered here uh, not so early in the morning, but early now. I have much gratitude to Mukdaji, the Ministry of Culture, and all of you for honoring the Asian Heritage Foundation and me with a gracious opportunity. Sachi Daranji, Rabachi, wonderful. I do know I don't know how to follow their act. But it was eye-opening, and it was so much to teach us all. Um, let me first speak about this thing about being India's first scenographer. I don't know. The roots for anything go so deep in India, and certainly much before we were even born. Although my design-led engagement has been more than five decades, my journey as a formal scenographer got charted only 25 years ago. And therein lies a story. I'd never heard the word scenography till one was coerced into registering a formal practice, Rajiv City Scenographers, Private Limited, in 1997. The Germans commissioned me to create one of its six team pavilions for the Expo 2000 at Hanover. But I needed my company to be registered as a sonographer. That's the parliament. Years after I completed my assignment, India's income tax department 
which had also never heard the term stenographers, thought I was exporting manpower, stenographers. Tax relief due to me as a designer was challenged. And this case had to go all the way to the Supreme Court with the fabulous Karuna Nandi fighting my case to spell the difference, scenographer and stenographer. So it wasn't easy being India's first. Uh, I'm just wondering, is it going to be possible to do this? Uh, so let just take it up forward. Let me get to the point. Yeah. And that actually takes me to the very first point of my deliberation today. Celebrating failures is about showing you the few battles I think one has won while highlighting the huge war being rapidly lost by the creative community. Irrespective of governments in power, the policy agenda on culture remains sporadic and uneven. There is no ecosystem to synergize culture as a sustainable resource, and our failure will become more spectacular with the onslaught of artificial intelligence and virtual reality. When coupled with a de-skilled generation, time-honored pehchan, or what Shachidharanji was speaking about, traditional knowledge systems, can shrink or be reduced to lip service. Why are our ghars, that's what we called museums, so bereft of engaging with original homespun narratives? Why does our training lack the art of staging? Why are we getting increasingly scared of experimenting? Why are we fearful of imagination? Why don't we simply put, have enough manpower and money, resources, to set things right? Our first battle was how to establish tools of design through an improvisational process. How do we reveal new repositories for cultural dissemination. We created bespoke performances at monuments. I'm talking about 40 years ago. It was called Gunse Patthar, Resonant Stones, as a part of the Up Now Utsav in 1986 by the National Cultural Festival, of which I was then the director general. We created bespoke performances at monuments like Sangeet Sure Parikrama at the Purana Kira, Pandit Birju Maharaj singing and dancing the poetry of Abdul Rahim Khan Khana at his tomb, poetry of protest at Khuni Darbaza. And then in 1957, to read, to do the 150th anniversary of the rebellion uh, at the Red Fort, or the hidden river of Pedrai conceived and put together, challenging gender stereotypes, was staged at a destroyed mill. May I try to define scenography? Scenography is the word that we need to utter on this stage. As it cracked up for us, it is a seamless synthesis of space and time, text and research, intuition and emotion, art and audience, all synergize for immersive experiences. Good scenography unites the elements, connects intangible senses with tangible content, creates a dramaturgy between architecture and theater, real time and sight, enhancing context and the interface. The scenographic profession is an emerging new discipline with wide ranging capabilities, but it is still not taught in India. Museums, biennales, exhibitions, theatrical shows, installations, events become curatorial stages to explore layered narratives. In my own work, I like to mix high-tech with low-tech, putting contemporary and more popular media together. I engage with talent from villages and small towns. 
opening new aesthetic possibilities. At the foundations, they, uh, it shares the scenographic intent. And when we put up a Ram Leela or launch a plan for urban renewal or creative new livelihoods, we use this thing on creative and cultural industries. I think even the word design doesn't exist in Indian vocabulary. So one uses, so scenography of course will not. So one uses the word shilpa, calling myself a shilpkar. In a Kave Pradhan Desh, I'm looking beyond words. Akar, seeking the nirakar. Formless beyond light and shade. I like air in the cloud or fragrance star or tears in the eyes. Design gives a force, a face to society. But if society becomes derivative, losing its spirit, what can design do? At HF, we use two instruments of design. HF is Asian Heritage Foundation. The traditional skills and transdisciplinary experiences. This helps me in my personal journey to remain a jack of all trades. I write, dance, sing, paint, cook with all my senses, all six senses, making, doing, and being. Vishnu Varamotra Puran states very clearly that if you want to be an architect, you have to be a dancer. To be a dancer, you need to be a musician, sculpture, poetry, mathematics, all gets connected. The only means to measure creativity is with emotional intelligence, cutting across all boundaries between science and humanities, art and craft, high and low, margi, deshi, east, west, minimalist, postmodernist, etc. How seamless can an experience become? Charles Eames, my mentor, said, everything connects. However, let's shrink the flap. Here are only 15 minutes left, I think. And I have to illustrate a few projects will take much longer. And I just learned due to a technical glitch that I have not been able to edit the vast amount of material that's in this machine. And I may have to go very quickly. So to those of you not from the MTV generation like me, you might get irritated. But I'm afraid there is no way out. Have to keep to a time. Forgive me. So this has been implemented by studios all over the world. Let me show you the basic needs pavilion at the Expo 200, 2000 in Hanover. When I became a scenographer, creating a compelling thematic experience, I started by distinguishing greed from need, working with the Wuppertal Institute of Factor 4. You walked into this store, and anything you picked up would have a price which you would pay. But actually, you're not paying that price. The carbon footprints, the entire, what we call the factor four, which we had to be detailed with the institute, required to be explained what it means. So a yogurt packet could mean the aluminum foil, the printing inks, the dairy product, the grids, Amazon, and many other factors that would certainly not make it so cheap. So the poor are paying for somebody's luxury. And there was a big store that you entered, and anything you picked out there would have a different uh, price tag and what you want. There were other parts, which I won't go into details, but there was a, a, a very, uh, it was 70,000 square feet, and it traveled, I traveled to what, almost 50 countries to collect things which represented the concept of our own Panchabamut, but on the elements, air, which this is on air, for example, but then there were others on livelihoods that I will not be able to go. All these were made specifically almost site-specific, but for the exhibition itself that was in, in Germany. One of the more exciting things was going to China and working with the very um, disruptive artist from China to talk about a very tangible basic need, intangible basic need on freedom, on the concept of uh, peace or the concept of uh, uh, love. And so working with uh, people like Wang Jin and Lin Ying and Ying Yang and Yang Hashabin, 
Gaobo, Song Dong, to develop artworks that evoke concepts of freedom. So there were many. Richard Gere gave me all his photographs of what he'd done in Tibet. I used Tibet as a theme. I, didn't make me very popular with the Chinese government, but that's the way it is. Each of this is a story I won't go into, which is very simple. Song Dong creates this uh, wood block, which are being burnt and used to line bridges, and he's painting on water, on the Lhasa River. But um, what's the point of painting on water? So what he's saying is, really, but can you stop the spirit from saying what it wants to? even if you put all kinds of issues. Each story is a long one. I won't be able to go, and they're extremely um, disruptive, and they challenge authority, and they talk about needs as human beings must. Love, and then it, the whole exhibition, my exhibit ended as a celebration specially created with the Bread and Puppet Theater in USA, and it bought from the inside to the outside. So they were huge. So all the wastes that were used in the exhibition that I had to bring from all over the world could transform itself into puppets, which is what you're saying. In fact, there's a tiny film that if I can show, how? Is press this? You see the scale. This is part of the exhibition. design came from outside to inside, as I said, making it an award-winning pavilion, and it was received by the world press, you know, which was a way that we could support our activities back here. Now about the scenography. As I said, no one in India is really the first of anything. Uh, just a month ago, I passed this cliff that's being cut by road building, and the people have converted it into a, a roadside shrine but with a great sense of space, of place, of, um, of, of a emotion and of a time and of a narrative which changes from season to season. This is an egg merchant's house. These are, this is a scarecrow designed by a farmer thinking of what the bird might see as women working in the field. It's completely contemporary as an idea but imagine a farmer designing a scarecrow, emulating what the bird might see. A stone merchant's house. So, to museums, where reflect change becomes extremely critical, to celebrate even ephemeral expression. I worked with the Bhopas and Bhopis, who are balladeers in villages of Rajasthan, to retell the story, because the skill of Babuji Kapar was used for a certain specific time, whether the camel was ill or they was waiting for the crops to ripen 
and there was fear and hope. But now they don't, when we talk about that skill of painting and the skill of narration, uh, uh, we don't have stories that will keep people occupied when seasons are changing, when kinds of seeds are changing, diseases are changing. What keeps them alive and going? That's the theme you will see recurring in much of what the foundation has been trying to do later. So we did a Azadi Kapar, which was on 37 songs written specially for the freedom struggle, where in many villages, people didn't know enough about it. And the idea was to talk about our modern narrative of where we are going as a nation. This led me to take you to, through the first exhibition in 78 that I did called Aditi and the Mela, first at the National Craft Museum, and then going to the Barbican Center in UK to open it, and finally at the Museum of Natural History in the USA, Smithsonian, in 1985. Uh, Aditi piece was, Aditi was celebrating the life began with an archeological womb-shaped sarcophagus nesting in a body in a fetal position from the Deccan Museum. I don't know if anybody is here from there, but I borrowed from about 50 museums in 84. It wasn't very easy, even at that time. Alongside, I created a multi-religious shrine consecrated by all the artists accompanying the exhibit. Each day began with a prayer before the hall opening to the, open to the public, celebrating the rites of passage from fertility, courtship, marriage, childbirth, and thereafter. The exhibits were interfaced with live action on the museum floors themselves, establishing a tentative relationship of arts and crafts with performance through the human passage of life. So you might, for example, pass this Beirupia, and you might see Nardana Reshwar nearby in the gallery itself. Uh, it changed the concept of museum display, uh, how, how an exhibition can be, because it was evolving. There's um, Jeeva Soma and the late Ganga Devi painting on the walls of my exhibition every day to change. So people wouldn't just come one and do an exhibition. They would keep coming back to engage with themselves and how the process developed. Both Aditi and Mela, moving from inside to the outside in the Washington National Mall, had unprecedented media attention. But then, what after that? Where are the artists today? Bandied about the world as India's repository and brought back to the, to the, to be dumped together in slums. Uh, and these are now vertical slums that are supposed to come up but in, they're living in a transit camp for the last eight years. And Aditi and much before the Expo, there are two other projects that talk about mainstream issues. Uh, this is all part of Aditi. Sorry, I should have... That's this welcoming the child with songs and cradles and promised world safeguarding the child, his first walk, his first feed, going out to Mela, and then that Mela was out in the mall. If you notice in the photograph, the Ravens are being burned to the National Mall. The, the pent Pentagon is in the back, lit up somewhere. So there was a great um, breaking of boundaries between art and craft, and also between uh, audiences and the exhibits, and Western East, because life cycle is universal. It received a lot of notices. I was very keen to bring the politics to the main stage as to these people who we bandy about as a repository of our culture come back and don't have homes to live in. What do we do? So it was, of course, as an exhibition a success, but nothing happened. Another exhibition, which is in the 70s, uh, we believed India had to represent concerns of the global south at international fora. This meant mainstreaming arts and crafts to highlight issues that were left to DAVP, to those who won't know, Department of Audiovisual Publicity, is the kind of a publicity in the 70s that we all smiled at. Artists were never consulted. So forum of people happened at World Commission Conference, and there is a young man, the Romanian, but at Botifo, where I tried to redefine the role of art on conveying the quality of life. We spoke about... I didn't deserve that. <laughs> uh, 
We spoke about on conveying the quality of life. We spoke about mother's health, rural clinics, and critical to population control. Development is the best pill. And of course, they did. Then another one, the second one was a self-help housing. This is in the 70s, uh, where I sat on a bicycle, moving multiple screens, and puppets would come out of it, and there were many things. Now, this is, the reason why I'm showing this is this was for 30, 35 years, we tried to mainstream issues which artists can attempt to, to become a part of, to explain to an audience that has suddenly relegated art to art galleries or to places which are far away and not accessible. This is where I would pour the Department of Culture to, to let artists create art to explain even mainstream issues like roti, kapra, makan, jal, jungle, zameen, nokri, urja, ladki. The parliament, for example, is a place for debating these issues and must not remain sterile with safe decoration. It must take on things that keep changing, evolving. I know Sachita Ranji is involved with this, and we hope to see some change in that when, we come, when, when it's all up. So this particular exhibition had its trajectory of uh, fame, and I turned inwards. I thought enough of the West, that was in six, before the festivals of India, but I'd given up and I went and worked in a village in Rotak for about three years. And we were turning inwards, how does the future evolve? So I set up the Bhule Bisre Kalakar Sehkari Samiti. It was the first cooperative of itinerant performing artists who also banned the exhibitions that I did. But they were uh, the people who were part of um, the four groups were classical musicians, craftspeople, weavers, and popular performing artists meeting at Achoraha, and Sarthi was an NGO that I set up to, which is still functioning, for, for as friends of artists in need, looking at their basic issues of shelter, of marketing, of uh, pride and privileges, and issues like that. The neighborhood museum was a very important issue at that time for me, and we set up the Dihati Kara Kendra, in, again in Rota at that time, but again, it's all bureaucratic and decide decisions are taken without consulting either the people or the artists or the people involved. And these things get um, sidelined and efforts lose themselves because we have, they have not created a sustainable model. They have not really worked to make it uh, empower the people that is where I think has been my greatest failure. So the hand as a supreme instrument, where I'm talking about art and craft mix, where we see the dexterity of finger. Only human beings can do this. Monkeys can swing on branches, but only him. And that has a direct connection to our mind and to the evolution of our brain. So I started in 72 with Kashmir crafts, re reviving them for a total new audience. It went on to Louis Vuitton, that had me do a thousand windows all over the world, looking at their, uh, all the traditional paper making techniques. So what you're looking there is all hand painted, but on 3D objects, which were made out of paper for Diwali as a light, as a lantern. Then there were also uh, special things that were made for Louis Vuitton, which included jewelry, etc. So Goldeneye in 1985, I'm going to dwell on. Uh, we, the third exhibition of the Festival of India, and it had in very important designers and architects who, prayer group, almost all of them are dead, come and work with me in the villages in India to create this. For the lack of, so Kesri Aram built this bench, which is now in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Yukas and Ettore Sotsas, Roberna Dudowski, shoes again made by Mochiral, who's a um, uh, shoemaker, all of them are, are dead. Charles Moore working in Banaras with toys with me and a group of craftspeople there. Um, Jack Larson, Mary McFadden, Hans Holine, Milton Glazer and Ivan Shamayev on toys 
toys has become a big thing. That time, toys was not so, not accessible. So Fry Otto, the, you know, the one who did the Munich Olympics, uh, did forks and knives and worked in pottery in Kurja, made huge tents that could be bringing a new market for traditional craft skills. So these were noted. There were four reviews in the New York Times and in all the various papers at that time. There was a book being written as well by Mrs. Onassis, and it had a fanfare. But all these things were battles. We won a few. But where did we go from there? And that's the war. Everything was bought back, locked by the bureaucracy in a go-down. It caught fire, and everything was destroyed. It never shown to the people who had to see it. Again, the Silk Road. The Silk Road happened in the Smithsonian, and I recreated the Silk Road traveling to many countries all through the Silk Road and bringing artisans and performers to Washington to create a multi-dimensional and also transdisciplinary uh, manifestation that lasted seven days. Uh, I'm not going to be able to describe each of these slides because, I mean, this is just, for example, the blue pottery from Jing de Zen up to Delft, how these motifs appeared on the Silk Road, whether it be Tree of Life or the Dunhuang Caves, which, by the way, now in the National Museum, we have a great space. Some of the most priceless um, antiquities that nobody has in the world are in India. An Orlstein story that I can't tell now. The tiger seen on the Silk Road. The tents that we made all over were embroidered, whether from Arabia to China, India. The angels on the Silk Road, again, all made in three-dimensional. The transportation on the Silk Road was a truck from Pakistan that I took to America. And of course, this also had a vast amount of support from the press. And it's important to tell people where these people with strange countries, with Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, where were they? Because this is just after 2002, which is the World Trade Center. How Knick building bridges was to a population that has become very, very um, fearful. So we started this journey even in India, Asian journey, I called it, with the South Asian for our South Asian neighborhoods, a subcontinent revealing a civilization memory. HF has struggled hard to work in our neighboring countries, but the dream remains undeveloped. Where these are the 10, uh, the India in the center, which is physically, with Pakistan and Afghanistan and Nepal and Bhutan and Bangladesh, Myanmar, Sri Lanka and the Maldives as a pool of lotuses. This is about 30 years ago. And a symbol for everyone, which is symbol for anybody working in the field of culture, is diversity, connectivity, empowerment, peace. So let's move on to, there's a Barcelona thing that I was a sonographer to the Olympics of culture that they wanted to make it into. Uh, I was the chief sonographer and a goodwill ambassador for the Senate committee. And it was, I did a sky of aspirations, trees of life, various things that people had to, had to accrue all these big nets that had to come down and go up again and were made in about six different cities where I had to go and get people to make wishes to tie like a mannat on a whole sky that covered the Barcelona plaza with some shade for the, for the activities that had to then take place underneath. There was also a Tree of Life courtyard based on uh, cooperative action and this led me to uh, my engagement with the Planning Commission, the erstwhile Yojana Bhavan, still the Yojana Bhavan, but before Niti Ayog, on be, to chairing a task force. I was vice chairperson, but I was steering the task force on culture and creative industries, creating an edge for India in the global knowledge society. Later on, I was again called, Amitabh Kant had 17 secretaries of the government of India, represent this whole report that was about um, 1,500 pages explaining what creative and cultural industries and the synergies of that for our country can be, what this includes, which is at the moment bifurcated in nine different ministries in our country and losing the synergy, losing on the capital that it can generate of different kinds. And uh, I think with all that effort in the government and outside, inside, 
I still couldn't get any headways. So I'm sure the failure was mine. And we could not do it, and we set up then Geo. This is Mahatma Gandhi's handwriting, believed by and belong, which was to be artisan-owned, a pioneering creative and cultural enterprise, upskilling and augmenting rural livelihoods to promote conscious products and services. Taking this philosophy forward, AHF conceived this, and craft collectives, design academia, were all coming together, and this position was purported by Japan's Social Development Fund and the World Bank. And we went to many, many clusters of Susani, Kalamkaris, Bagh, Kotpar, Gond, and many others, but I can give you a slight glimpse of all that was produced and is still lying, ready to be marketed. But again, uh, the Secretary of Textiles was kind. She came about three, four months ago to see everything and felt that we should re, uh, re restart. But time is of the essence. And uh, I'm afraid files move slower than humans. Um, Boat building is equally important. Many, many boat builders are dying away. Animation, billions of dollars of industry. Why are we looking at putting a dhoti on Spider-Man? That's not going to give you any revenue. That will give eyeballs to somebody else, Warner Brothers. So you've got to create your own characters, your own people, your own images, and your own stories, your own narratives. Um, so, of course, this is all on, uh, on uh, why we need a brand of the skills themselves. This is all in the last few years. Uh, the airport, I'm afraid, since most of you have probably gone to Bombay, it was intended as a new museum of the 21st century. I set up in 2017, but before the airport, which I don't think anyone here would have seen, I was asked to do the, the precursor to this, it was in 1982. It was a lounge that was done for a very extraordinary conference, like the G20, it was then with non-aligned nations and Commonwealth, and I was asked by the Prime Minister, then Mr. Indira Gandhi, to do it. And it was the first airport that had to be done in Delhi. And this is what it looked like. Uh, Hussein was working with me on all the murals outside. And Mrs. Gandhi also wrote saying, we have to preserve this and get this published in various magazines. It all happened. But what happened then? I'm told that everything is either lost. The other day I found one painting of Angelina Menon that was specially made, shown in the National Gallery, with two plates missing. And they didn't know what the original would look like, or what it was, actually. So I feel that things just go away. This is me, much younger at that time. And there were, as I said, many, many. So I'm not going into the airport, and I'll just be very quick, because I think that's something you can all go to and see. And also, for your purpose, there is, after this is over, because I'm running out of time, I need to just quickly show you. This is available for you to see. My grandson trying to help me. Go on. So this is what you're seeing, actually. But it'll be staying here. You can't see it all, because I'll put it here right now for you to examine because I'm not going to be able to show these slides. How they were made also is all being explained. Uh, he uh, spoke about the mushrubias, but all the on fire, water. There are films in this which I can't show. This is on thresholds of India. And let me go on quickly. So a lot of support has come from the corporate sector. Some, not all, but they were wanting to do mainly their offices, their homes, and as long as it brings craftspeople to come and work there, I am willing to do anything. But it is uh, shrinking. It's not something that's growing, because tastes develop differently. And I think access to India and its many crafts becomes a little more difficult than we imagined. Those practicing, working in the field, know what we're going through. Sachiranji referred to what's happening to craftspeople. In the, hang, in the throes of middlemen, you refer to designers, that's true too. Design lehenga can cost two crores or two lakhs, but the artisan gets not even a pittance of that. That happens. But I would use 
design help. I would use all this to get the maximum from it. Anyway, so I'm not going to show you the airport because you've seen it, or some of you will see it, and I will just rush through. But it was hailed then as a first large public museum because with 40 million footfalls, it automatically has a presence more than all our museums put together. So if mountain, if Mount Mohammed can't get to the mountain, let the mountain go to places where people will access it. So creating museum in public spaces is a huge necessity, more and more. And 2% of whatever you cost for a building, according to Government of Indian guidelines, should be spent in arts and craft. This rule is never followed to the spirit. And that, I think, is important to realize why it is essential. I can see it's now, now too late for me to do this. I'll conclude. I will not uh, show you other projects that have been done, uh, including uh, the homes and public offices of the Adani. My Jijmans, I will never say anything. But in, for seven years, I developed a whole lot of things on bees, which were with scientists. Eman Swaminada, Pushpa Bhargav, Rehman playing the... So these are all things that I, I must quickly go. Sorry, this is... I just want to conclude. Just give me two more minutes and I'll conclude. Um, that's the Adani house. Sorry. These are all my sculptures. And sculptures done with artists. This is mine. Done with artists working co-creation. I don't like the word creation. We co-create. We think of a site. We think of a place. We think of a medium. We think of a skill. And then we create something on a theme that we think that particular person wants. This luxury to be bespoke is particularly India. It's the luxury that only India can afford. And no other country can go close. So I'll just finish this presentation of mine with what I wanted to share with you in the end. Sorry. I, technical glitches that this should have been all edited, but I couldn't do it. Just last minute, I had to get something else to put in here. And therefore, we've not been able to edit it before. Ah, so I'm coming down.
to be implemented, which is Karwai. Governments, civil societies, corporate entities, and even more urgently, each family counts. I think the Prime Minister at this Expo's inaugural offered a profound mantra. Let each house contain a museum. How is this going to be made possible in our lifetime? Like the urgency of awareness I spoke about, we have to generate a complete ecosystem to deliver and be answerable. Jawab Dehi. So, Sunwai, Karwai, Jawab Dehi. And I conclude. I repeat, all private and public endeavor, a memory of tangible and intangible repositories are essential. We need connectivity of stakeholders. We need emotional linkages. We need manavta, sabhita, not just Sanskriti. Awakening beyond commerce or culture. Our museums today geared to share the quintessential essence of our composite living heritage. Who will evolve authentic experiences invoking rasa within our digital metaverse, increasingly diminishing human interface? Anubhuti, where the eyes breathe and the dust settles on the mirror of our heart, when the mind and the spirit soar, then color is tasted, the eyes hums into the air, and the being soars, reaching for out, for more and more deep within. Sorry. May I end this intervention, like many others over the last few years, with my favorite lost cause metaphor the musk deer representing our learning repositories, searching frantically in the forest for a fragrance that actually lies within the womb. Kasturi Kundali Base, Mrigudhunde Banmai. And so, my friends, the museum movement sits thirsty beside the river. We sit hungry under a tree laden with fruit. Potent seeds are clenched tight in a fist as they rot. Please let's keep our palms open. Few may fall off, but no seed is shy of germination, nor does any fruit remain on a branch when ripe. Let's make sure it falls on fertile soil. Many thanks, and sorry for taking longer than I was planning. Thank you, Mr. Sethi. I mean, in spite of the technical glitches, I think this was a visual treat. Um, it's as, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I loved what you said about separating the greed from the need. And um, uh, thank you for sharing your journey and your five decades of practice. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, may I request Nazneen Bano, ma'am, uh, the director of NGMA Bangalore and Mumbai to please come on stage and present a memento to respected Rajiv Sethiji. Uh, we are grateful to respected Rajiv Sethiji and all the panelists for uh, giving us an insight for how we can learn from the experience of private museums. Put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, express our gratitude to Rajiv Sethiji, Padma Bhushan a renowned designer, a scenographer, and art curator. I will request Nazin Ma'am to present a memento to Mr. Asad Lalji, who moderated this session and uh, contributed in such a way uh, for this session. We are grateful to Asad Lalji. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asadji.
So ladies and gentlemen, uh, during this three days International Museum Expo 2023, we have arranged seven master classes by global experts on various, uh, various topics, running from the setting up of a museum to capacity building of museum professionals in a scientific way in accordance with the latest state of the art technologies and international benchmarks and standards. Now it's time to be part of such a masterclass by Dr. Shubha Chaudhary ji, who is with us. Uh, Dr. Shubha Chaudhary ji is uh, Associate Director General, American Institute of Indian Studies. She has done PhD in linguistics. Dr. Chaudhary has been with the Archives and Research Center for Ethnomusicology of the American Institute of Indian Studies since its inception, that is in 1982. And director since 1985. So please put your hands together to welcome for this master class Dr. Shubha Chaudhary ji uh, who will be with us and uh, sharing and guiding us with her experience, vast experience. Uh, we welcome Dr. Shubha Chaudhary ji on stage.
but I might be off it, na? Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Um, sorry for the delay. We had, as always, some glitches uh, with the, the connectivity. Um, so having a, a master class on audiovisual archives for museums sounds a little dull after a fantastic presentation, hard act to follow by Sri Rajiv Sethi. So um, the idea of this being a master class, I don't quite understand how the format should go, but I think that there should be room for questions because it's a little dense topic. And we were talking about the fact that there's a lot of audiovisual material in museums, and archives and museums have a lot in common, but there is an area that we need to pay attention to, which is more the archiving of the audiovisual material. So uh, when we are talking of archives and museums, Archives, museums, and libraries we see as being memory institutions and having a lot of overlap, though we have very distinct definitions for each of them. But we can see that there's a lot in common. Uh, for example, as we've been seeing, museums have largely objects. The whole view of them is curatorial. It's display-oriented. It's meant for public access and has collections. So we see museums and archives both have collections. Instead of original objects that museums have, archives have original documents. And we would refer to the audiovisual documents as also documents. But archives are more preservation oriented. As a result, there's controlled access. And yet they have a lot in common. Libraries, as we all know, are public spaces. They have individual items. They don't look at collections and again, made for public access. I'm sure there's a lot of definitions that we can go, but what I would like to also say that these sound like very distinct entities, but there's a lot of overlap, as we're trying to show on the slide. So some of the biggest archives are at the US Library of Congress, which was also the first place in the US that started documentation of oral literature. Uh, the British Library, contains, in fact, what used to be the archive of the UK. So uh, the National Sound Archive is now part of the British Library. Uh, the Musée de l'Homme in France had its own archive, which is now part of the K. Broly Museum. Also, the archive goes to CNRS. So what I want to say is that museums have, uh, have had archives for many years and archives are sometimes in libraries, they're sometimes in museums, as well as the other way around. The National Library of Australia, in fact, holds the uh, audiovisual archive of Australia in it. So uh, just to say that these sound like very discrete entities, but there's a lot of overlap, and it just depends where they're all situated. What I would like to focus on are the needs of audiovisual uh, media within museums. And the reason is that when we first, as an archive, held training courses, we found that the people who were coming from museums for training to us were coming because they found they had collections of audiovisual media, of tapes, and so on, lying in their museums, and they didn't quite know how to handle them. So that is really the focus of this today. And as I said, um, it's all a little dense, so I'm going to try and uh, be happy to take questions. So um, what are the things that the museums have by way of audiovisual media? One, they may have legacy material, which is what I mentioned, which might be analog tapes that have been lying there for a long time. This material that's already lying there. Most museums have a program of documentation and research, and they very likely have created audio and video tapes and recordings as part of those, and they may be also part of the legacy materials. Audiovisual media is also greatly used in museums to contextualize and enhance display. 
we see frequently, you know, a sound recording of an instrument being placed next to it, or uh, museums like Cape Broly, in fact, have extensive video coverage of the culture where the artifact comes from. Um, in India, our Arna Charna Museum in, in Jodhpur, which has large collection of brooms, for instance. So the brooms don't look so exciting, but when you have a video display going on showing how brooms were made and talking to the people, then you get. Oral histories are being greatly used now by museums as well. Also in today's time, museums may create audiovisual resources for dissemination and for use on the internet. The internet's ability to handle audiovisual media has greatly increased what people want to do with that. And then we have, of course, the whole category of interactive museums today. Now, those may be interactive in terms of interacting with the community, with the practitioners, but also digitally interactive. As a result, they use uh, audiovisual media. And today we have museums which are more or less entirely digitally audiovisual, like we have the Experience Music Project in the Seattle. In India, we have the Indian Music Experience. So there are many now, the Grammy Museum and so on, which are totally relying on audiovisual media as the means of uh, showing culture or heritage or modern uh, popular culture or whatever it is. So all of these is using audiovisual media in the back. And what I am wanting to talk about is the need to archive these in the back. Yes, you're creating them for display, you're creating them for public use, you're creating it for the internet, but these are very valuable assets in their own way. And it's important that museums pay attention to treating these in the same way as they would treat museum objects and think about archiving them. So of course the media is very different and that's why we think there's a crossover here and need for this discussion. So, um, sorry, kind of running behind on this. All right. So, as I said, why should museums then archive? I already started talking about it. There are uh, museums which have audiovisual archives in them, professionally run audiovisual archives. They are there already. So I don't want to talk about them because they are there, they are archives, they are following archival standards, they exist. So we will leave them out of the discussion from now. The next is, all museums believe in preserving the original. So preserving the original recordings should become part of the same mandate. The other important thing is that audiovisual media is very fragile. It's difficult to store well, it's difficult to access, so the fragility of it requires that we follow archiving norms. It relies on multiple technologies. As we all know, we've gone from cassette to reel and VHS and DAT, and it goes on and on. So whatever is the, is the technology of the current times, you will have a whole lot of uh, range of those, as well as you require technology for playback, for access. So the whole technological reliance in, case, in the case of audiovisual media becomes very high. And as a result, it's important for us to think about what we should be doing to archive them to overcome this. The important thing also about recording is that they preserve an ephemeral moment. Unlike an object, you know, a, a recording is of that time. It's of something that's happened right then, and then it's over. So your recording is the only record of that moment, which otherwise remains in your memory, which is why we call archives as part of uh, memory institutions. So coming to the nitty gritty, the first thing I talked about was legacy materials. Now legacy materials we largely refer to analog recordings. Now analog recordings, the big requirement is storage and handling. So we really need to create proper storage for whatever it is that you have by way of legacy analog material. It needs a dedicated storage space. Mainly it needs stability of temperature and humidity. So whatever is the coldest and driest that you can provide for your recordings, it's important. The important thing is that there should be no variation within the day, within the year, because expansion and contraction causes the chemicals to flake off. 
to get damaged. We've all seen enough damage tapes in India to understand that. So that is something that we need to deal with for legacy recordings. And as we move on to digitizing, you may say, why should we hang on to this original analog recordings? The reason is technology is always changing. And what you digitize today, there may be a superior system a few years down the line, but you've lost your original, you can't go back to it. So no matter how you digitize, no matter what you do, I would greatly say that there's a need to hang on to your legacy materials in recordings the same way as you would hang on to your original objects of uh, yesteryears. So, and when we come to audiovisual media, the whole uh, issue of preservation has moved to digitization. I'm sure you all know that. That today, to preserve audiovisual material, we have to digitize. And what has, what has been the aim of this is that we are no more looking at preserving only the carrier, but we are looking at the content. So, what we were earlier doing is looking very, as I've already said, the importance of maintaining those original recordings in temperature, humidity control, how you handle what you do, is very, very important. But the means of preservation today are forcing us to digitize, which means, yes, we are going to look after the carrier, which is what carries the recording, but we are now looking at migrating the content. So when you digitize, you're moving the content from its fixed analog recording to a digital file. So why are we digitizing with all the things? Frankly, we don't have a choice today. The main problem that archives are facing and museums will and everybody else will is hardware obsolescence. We do not have cassette players. We do not have open reel players. We don't find VHS to play back our VHS. So as hardware is going out of the market, we are forced to leave behind our analog masters, though things may change. Today, turntables are being made again. So this may happen. Technology is changing too fast. So only by moving to the digital medium, to some extent, we are able to stall that. So what happens is that at least when you digitize, you are preserving it as it is at that time. If there's a damage, Okay, it is stalled there because now it's a digital signal. As you saw in the earlier slide, zeros and ones. Everything gets converted to zeros and ones, so it stays exactly where it is. The internet has created a big demand for digitization because demand for access, the way it has come. So everybody now, you want to access, and so digitization becomes the only way for you to do that. It greatly aids communication. We are able to share. Once it's a file, it's a file. Whether it's audio, it's text, it's video, or an image, it can be used the same way. It can go with your email, it can be downloaded. So it helps that and also helps convergence that we're trying to do all the time. So really, um, fortunately or unfortunately, there is really not much of a choice for digitization. And it's very, very essential today for preserving audiovisual media. So, uh, as I said, what are the implications? The good points of it are that, one second, right, okay. Uh, there's no generation loss. Once you have, I mean, you can have generation loss if you make a very compressed copy, but once you have a digital file, you can make another and another and there's no generation loss. There's no wear and tear, unlike a tape which you play eight, 20 times and you'll hear it. And you stall, stall degeneration, at least for the digital object. Greatly helps access, aids dissemination, you're able to publish easily, you can disseminate over the net, so you can disseminate over your mobile phone, I mean, it just is multiple ways that you can do that. The physical storage is that, is a big cost for most archives, like museums. And when we talk about the digital medium, we are reducing the, the physical I found a relief that we could, we are moving from 
something which was very specialized, the audiovisual domain, where you needed audio engineers to deal with everything, where we didn't find people who could service our machines or you know, deal with all of our analog material. Once it's digital, you're part of the IT mainstream. So your backup systems, whether you're a bank or a cultural archive, it's the same. So you can access whatever is the mainstream IT solutions. It no more belongs to a very specific cultural or a audio domain that is preserve of a few specialists. With pros, there are always cons. <laughs> a, no permanent solution. A digital file is not your long-term solution. It's going to go on changing. We find that every digital storage we set up in every five years maximum, you have to budget for changing your digital storage. Or the NAS is not going to work, the ID drive is not going to work, the SCSI is not going to work. So you need constant migration. Unlike our old analog days, where we treated them much like museum objects. You kept them cold and dry and safe and handled them well and they were safe. A digital file is as fragile. It's easy to delete with one click unlike a whole tape which you might have to erase. So there's constant migration. And there's again a variety of formats because you have so many. If you just talk about audio, we have WAV, we have AIFF, we have MP3s and MP4s. And so you keep having formats and you have to keep upgrading yourself to make sure that you're in the current format which can then be accessed. Otherwise, we are all stuck with a lot of digital material which we cannot access. Think of those big floppy drives we used to have. They're digital. Do we have drives today to play them back on? So these are the issues. We have that which was digital. No DAT machines around to play them. So these are the problems even of that. And much as I talk about no generation loss, all digitization has the issue of compression. So every digital file, because it chooses little samples to digitize, it can have a lot of loss. So there's two aspects of lossy and lossless. We needn't go into that. But yes, it's compressed. So you do or you can lose data when you digitize. So as we spoke, the big advantage of digitizing audiovisual media is that and museums as well as archives greatly want to use this aspect of digitization is to use the internet, to use digitization with its new technologies. So what are the advantages of this that we can preserve and restore? I think you must have seen enough on restoration, digital restoration of whether it's images, it's painting, Once it's all a matter of zeros and ones, it's much easier to safeguard and promote because you can use the internet to do that. We are able to make use of many more educational and scholarly opportunities, enhance cultural exchange, all this becomes available. And a very important thing is that through the internet, we are able to reach new and niche audiences. So what happens is something that may have been restricted to a very few people, suddenly there's a whole community because of the way of sharing that there's maybe suddenly thousands of people interested in one particular song form or something like that. Now the internet enables that. It also has its drawbacks and it's something that I would like to discuss a little more. So once it's digitized, it's on the internet, how do you prevent that? Or do you go on the internet with each and everything? So recordings have that problem that you're able to duplicate a recording and you can put it on the net. A museum object, you can only take its photograph and put it up. The object is, doesn't duplicate itself, so it can't be stolen digitally quite in the same way. So this is something, a mindset, that people in museums will have to think about, that you can't use it any old way. It's open to commercial exploitation once it's there. As we all know, things that land up on YouTube without people giving their consent. And as a result, there's a lot of opening for violation of moral and ethical rights. 
So much as we say that recordings will enhance your museum as uh, objects, it will enhance what you can do. You have oral histories, you have ethnographies that you can bring into the museum, but you have to be also careful of a whole area of rights that you may or may not have thought of. I will come back to that, but one of the briefs I had was to talk about standards. So when we talk about archiving and we talk of digitization today, as we talked about temperature and humidity and storage, we have to follow standards when it comes to creating digital files. It's a bit of a thing, yeah. So I have a quotation here uh, from the International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives, why standards are important. Well, the main thing is that if we have to move forward, unless we have standard forms, you'll always, there'll be ways that we won't be able to move ahead. You need standards so that there's a standard way of migrating of things that also the market will have to obey. And there are a couple of resources here where you can find the standards for audio digitization and video digitization. I'm happy to share these later. There are three or four international bodies that deal with standards that are always changing as well. But, oh yo, sorry, it's not moving. Okay, there you are. So, um, we have here the two major ones for audio and video recordings. Also the Library of Congress, the Association of Recorded Sound uh, co Collections and Association of Moving Image Archives. They're some of the major bodies who deal with standards and we are good resources to keep abreast of whatever is going on. So coming back to what I had already spoken about earlier, not moving here. Okay. So, see often that you're talking about original objects in museums and physical ownership. And in audiovisual recordings, you have the whole issue I already mentioned of duplication. Um, archive, museums largely talk of institutional ownership and archives using the kind of recordings we do, we talk about community ownership. Now it's important to say here that museums are moving much in that direction. Museums and archives both have been moving more to a community approach uh, that today, we, not today, but even for several decades, we have had museums who are giving the ownership of certain objects to the community or giving back to uh, objects from communities that were taken or allowing them, like the museum in Vancouver, which lends its ceremonial masks to those tribes to perform their rituals and return them. So this is a changing scenario even in museums, that community ownership, dealing with rights of people, of the objects are also being considered. But this is, I think, too little, too late, and museums need to learn this, I think, from archives who are working on this to a much greater extent. But using of audiovisual recordings brings very much to the fore the issue I already mentioned of intellectual property rights. We cannot deal with recordings and audiovisual media without thinking of intellectual property rights, the law that we may have of copyrights and so on, and most importantly of ethics. So, ethical use of recordings as ethical use of objects and the way you collect, the way you display, the way you represent, the way you disseminate. All of these have very important aspects of moral and ethical issues. For a, a normal archive of the kind that I run, we talk about quite a few um, stakeholders of who we feel we have to take into consideration. There's a collector, the researcher, the recordist, the performers, either individual or a group, composers, lyricists, patrons, the community itself. This is just a few of the kind of stakeholders who have to be kept in mind when we use audiovisual media. 
And when we talk about archiving our material as museums, we do need to keep these in mind. Now, what are the legal and critical issues, that ethical issues that come up is that the Copyright Act has a lot of inadequacies. We're not able to deal with all our issues with the Act. Oral traditions are not protected under these. Moral and ethical rights are not part of our Act. Community rights are not dealt with. Local considerations are not dealt with. And sometimes international conventions also do not become part of our act. So there's a lot that the act leaves loose and open. And here's where our sense of moral and ethics has to come into play. And I think as museums and archives, we have to develop this as a way forward. More or less coming to the end. I'm seeing the time, yeah. The important issue of cataloging and metadata. Now, this is something that Museums and libraries have their own systems. So for an archive that's within a museum or a library, there is the challenge, and we know of many such institutions, where you're trying to fit archival, audiovisual archival requirements into your existing metadata structure. But you must, because otherwise it just gets left out, and that's why it's not part of the system. So uh, how can this be done? I think because we use Dublin Core, you can use that to expand. You have the same categories of intellectual metadata, of administrative metadata, of preservation metadata. Now, in objects, you look at where it came from. You look at provenance. In audiovisual archiving, also you look at preservation in the same way. Where did this recording come from? Where was it made? What did it move on to? So all of those preservation background, in case of recordings, is as important as provenance is for museum objects. And there are these existing bodies, like the Library of Congress, which have extensive resources available for audio and video and image metadata. So you can pick and choose what fields that you're able to incorporate into your museum uh, database, so that into your cataloging system, so that you're able to preserve the record because preserving material without the record that accompanies it will make no sense in the long run. You will not be able to use it when you don't know what it is. So it can be very valuable. It will just lie there and collect dust, whether it's in the digital domain or the physical domain. So that's really important to do that. And so I'd like to come to an end with that, to say that the separate worlds of libraries, archives, and museums should be subordinated to the emerging need to strengthen what we call the epistemic infrastructure of knowledge-based economy through a new view of collecting and collections. Thank you. We have a few minutes if there's any questions, since it's supposed to be a class. Yes. Do you have a mic or something? Not set up for questions. You have to be just loud, or I can come and talk to you afterwards. Hello, hello. Thank you very much for a very enlightening talk. My name is Anuradha Bhattacharya. I'm an oral historian. And uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, the obsolescence of hardware. So uh, would you like be able to tell us a little bit of how to circumvent it or any institutions which are keeping these old hardwares that we can take uh, the format stuff? Because uh, as an oral historian, I've made my recordings on various media. So. Well, I was trying to not say that, that museums who are not able to set up their own structure should then think of depositing with an audiovisual archive, uh, like us who we sit around trying to find old equipment. But it's really difficult. It's getting harder and harder because the people who can repair are fewer and fewer. And in our case, we have been having to import restored equipment the last few years. Obviously, it's a little cheaper than new equipment, but you cannot 
get a new cassette deck anymore. You can't get a new open reel recorder. And we have still hundreds waiting to be digitized. And this is the problem with a lot of places. So yes, going to institutions that are maintaining them may be one way forward. Because as individuals, it's very hard to do. Hello, ma'am. Will you elaborate on uh, the photo archives, the copyright issues of photo archives? Hello? Yes. Hello? Uh, will you please elaborate on the copyright issues of photo archives? So, um, for photography, according to our act, the photographer has the copyright. So now, uh, but all rights can be signed away. So if you're the photographer and you sell it to an institution and you transfer the copyright, it can be done. Uh, the problem is, of course, with the moral and ethical, that you know, it's a photograph of somebody. Should you be just using it? like my photograph there, <laughs> you know. Should you not have my permission how it is used? Now, we find this a lot, say, in tribal communities where people are exoticizing or they want to take photographs of everybody with tattoos or with this, and you're using that aspect and you say, oh, I have the copyright, you know, I can sell it, I can do what I like without permission of that person. But then you're violating certain moral ethical issues. But the Copyright Act in India gives the right to the photographer. Just to share, it doesn't happen with recording in our country. Like in certain countries, the person who presses the record button owns the recording. In India, we don't have that mechanical copyright, so it makes it much more complex for recordings. But for photographs, it's fairly straightforward. Thank you so much for explaining that. I'm Anandita, I work for a corporate archive. And I was wondering whether the same holds for the photographs and the recorded material that the corporate kind of commissions. Didn't quite get it. Uh, can you repeat? So the rights of the photographer or um, say for recorded material, is it slightly different in cases of commissioned work, work that is commissioned by somebody? See, paying and commissioning doesn't give you automatic rights. Okay. They still have to be properly got. You may pay me and I may sing, I may not have signed over the right. So you still need to get the right. A lot of people feel anything they paid for, they're buying yes. the rights. They're not. So that's a separate issue. Okay. Does that answer your question? Partly it does. I mean, because I come from a corporate archive background, I'm also thinking of, you know, events, product launches, and those kinds of events. Yeah. Events, and where we have a repository of material coming into our archives. How do we do the right thing, the morally right thing here? See, um, if you're talking about, say, Public events, that's yes. very, very hard because, you know, even if it's a traditional, like a big mela or a fair and festival, whose permission do you take? Mm -hmm. So it depends how you're using it. Right. So it's your own corporate event. You've got footage of it and you want to use it. But if at your event you had somebody performing, then that's a different issue. Right. If you have somebody performing, somebody dancing, singing, doing whatever it is, mm -hmm or you're making use of the fact that somebody was present, I think then you must have their permissions. Thank you so much. This clears it up. Thank you. Welcome. I think we're done. Any more question, please? Well, in that case, thank you so much for listening very patiently, which must have been a little dry masterclass of all the interesting ones you've been all listening to. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shubha. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Uh, under the under our master class series, we got opportunity to get enlightened on audio visual archiving. We are grateful to Dr. Shubha Chaudhary, Associate Director General, American Institute of Indian Studies. I will request my team to uh, present a memento. Please come in the center, ma'am, so that we can have a good photograph. And I will request you also to please put your hands together to express our gratitude to Dr. Shubhaji for this wonderful presentation and enlightening us. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, now it's time to take a break for lunch. And I will request the invitees and honorable to proceed and have lunch. But remember, 2 p.m. is the time to start the post-lunch sessions. So please be in time and after lunch, be seated before 2 p.m. It has been a wonderful experience having you all here during these proceedings of International Museum Expo 2023, organized by Union Ministry of Culture, Government of India. Thank you very much.